Warning. The following content may contain elements that are not suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Did you have any siblings or were you an only child? No, I had, uh, had six in total. Did you spend time with them at all? I did with my, on my dad's side because I was living with my dad. Uh, most of my childhood so you know I learned how to change diapers I learned how to give kids a bath making sure you warm up the bottle what to feed them what not to feed them taught my little sister how to walk essentially you know so it was um, wow so you were co-parent almost yeah I was was free babysitter that's what it was yeah Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's the official job title yeah welcome back to win the night podcast I'm your host Josh and tonight I'm bringing in another guy that also went into the military that I grew up with. Uh, I knew him as Casey Gallagher, but uh, how would you like to be introduced? Uh, you can introduce me as Casey. Um, you know, just use uh, layman's terms. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for joining us, man. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. Right now, like the, the main effort is uh, to get a community going and, you know, what better community than the ones, you know, that we grew up with and specifically with so many of us that uh, have similar backgrounds, uh, whether that's, we went to the military or um, uh, we have, there's a lot of guys right now that are having kids now, families. So um, I do want to kind of get a little bit in detail with, 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 uh, with how we know each other. Um, Now you and I, I don't know if you remember like the, the first uh, memory of, of like us meeting, but I distinctly remember fifth grade. Uh, does that ring a bell with you? Uh, I just remember always growing up with you. Like, I can't remember not knowing you. That's yeah. <laughs> kind of what Fair it enough. is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. Um, I, here's, here's one thing that uh, I was talking to you about just before we got started was uh, there's a very specific memory that I have of you, which is when uh, we were in fifth grade, we had to do, I don't remember if it was like a um, draw whatever you want or if it was just a thing of and that was like a project we had to do or you just like really liked to draw because I remember you made this like giant poster and uh it was like this big like uh it was almost like a combat like drawing and you had like all these buildings these helicopters and like I knew from that instant (laughs) this guy is going into the military and uh so so that's something that has been ingrained in my mind like a memory of you since then but growing up, did you have like an influence uh, to join the military? Uh, because obviously you're in the navy. You were in the navy for a while. Uh, what was your influence there? Uh, growing up, so my father. Uh, growing up, he was in the Marines actually first before mm. he became a police officer. And I'm sure you remember him uh, mm. working at the school sometimes and all that yep. stuff. But uh, before that, he was in the Marines because I was you know, big surprise and oopsie baby, uh, straight out of, you know, right out of high school. So my dad's, uh, you know, dreams of playing college soccer and all that went out the window. So he joined the Marines because his influence was, well, his grandfather or not my, well, his grandfather was in the Navy and then his father was in the Marines during Vietnam. Um, and so that was kind of like, it's like, well, at least, you know, I'll get paid, you know, three hots in a cot. Mm. and uh have my kid taken care of and whatnot mm-hmm. and uh at, at the time my mom being his wife but that didn't last very very long as uh, a lot of military spouses or relationships don't <laughs> yeah as as the legend goes right <laughs> yeah so i mean it was it was real typical like she she essentially left my dad for some dude that was in the army some N- nco in the army during that time so it was uh interesting for sure but uh, that was definitely the influence. I remember my dad being in his dress blues. You know, I went to the Marine Corps ball with him because he was uh, at the reserve unit in Chicago for a period of time because he worked in admin. So he pretty much wrote his own orders. <laughs> oh, beautiful. That's how that works. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like, well, back in the day, that's definitely how it worked before they, you know, for sure. they uh, had everything integrated and all that stuff. Like if you knew somebody at the, uh, uh, what's that place in um, you know, where they write the orders, but he was able to get a deal with that guy in Quantico and, uh, Quantico, Virginia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, regardless, uh, after he left the Marines, became a police officer, but, um, my decision to join the Navy was definitely heavily influenced by him later on in high school. Um, especially being good at swimming at the time when I was, um, 
you know so he's like oh the navy has a rescue swimmer program and i'm like oh sweet it'll be just like uh that one movie you know uh the guardian <laughs> <laughs> right yeah um before we get into that though I, i'm I'm, Go ahead. Re- I'm i'm very curious about uh what it was like i know you mentioned that you know your parents didn't work out so who did so you spent most of your time with your dad did you spend any time with your mom growing up Growing up, uh, yeah. So I don't know if you remember, I disappeared for essentially a year in high school. Um, for June, I was actually absent junior year because it was like the one time in my oh, life. Oh, that's right. You went. Uh, let me get here. Don't Germany. tell me. Yeah. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Uh, you, sorry. You did. No, you're good. I, I I had it already in my back of my mind, but I was like, no, you left the country. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. My dad. You know, he decided that was the best move because I was kind of getting into trouble and whatnot sophomore year, and he was like, mm. "All right." Let me try to save this boy before he becomes too corrupted. <laughs> so, so then, what uh, can I ask? What led, uh, what led to that? What was going on in in your life that was like causing that much trouble? Um. Well, uh, see, my dad, you know, his second marriage dissolved starting freshman year of high school. So I actually moved. I think. Yeah, five times during high school. Somehow managed to keep going Oak Forest, but I was like living in Fieldcrest with my grandmother for a while. And then, um, you know, kind of going from one place to another, then finally got an apartment. You know, my dad got an apartment after he kind of, you know, got his finances squared away and whatnot. Cause, you know, divorce uh, sometimes can leave you uh, with uh, two nickels to rub in your hand, right? It's a lot of, a <laughs> lot of debt, man. Uh, yeah, dude. So it was. Uh, so it moved and then finally he bought a house. So, um, but then after that, uh, I was kind of getting in trouble with the girl at that point. Um, we were both kind of getting in trouble with each other and whatnot. My dad kind of saw some parallels probably between him and my mom. Cause they, you know, my dad grew up in Oak Forest. My mom grew up in Markham. So he kind of saw some parallels. He's like, Oh, you know, I uh, probably should kind of give him a different taste of what like how life can be different so he sent me with my mother and she agreed because at the time she had gotten out of the air force because she was in the air force for eight Mm, years okay and then um yeah she joined like right before 9 11 but uh um yeah she was in for eight years and then she became an army contractor as a anti-terrorism officer and was uh working in bomberg germany at the time and so that's why I ended up getting sent to Germany. That makes that makes more sense. I was about to ask if that was something that, you know, your mom lived in Germany like permanently or No, she doesn't live there permanently anymore. She eventually stopped being a contractor uh just cuz she's, you know, she's like, "All right, I'm done working for Uncle Sam. I'm going to try to, you know, carve out something for me cuz she was kind of getting tired of uh just dealing with the DOD and all this stuff and uh dealing with um, at the time she was dealing with like some person that she worked for some general, I think he was like a, a two star over there for a uh, Eurocom. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So she, so wow. Okay. So she was working with, um, pretty, uh, high up people up there. Yeah. Her job was essentially to assess the risks posed, uh, to the bases, uh, in, in the, uh, European theater specifically so and then pretty much come up with ways that terrorists could attack the base effectively and then Mm -hmm. uh, create counter tactics to that well I mean that's a pretty stressful job if I ever heard of one how did she handle that yeah she was ah man a lot of uh see a lot Definitely. I remember there was definitely a few beers at the end of each day. <laughs> I, w- I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, like, that's a lot. You're dealing with uh, not just the stress of uh, trying to uh, the security of the base, but also uh, people talking in your ear, I imagine, all the time trying to get updates and whatnot. Updates. And then, of course, you have to work within budgets and then you have to sell the idea and then you have to lo- like work with local authorities. But needless to say, that's what she did for a while until mm-hmm. she decided that she was done with that. And she ended up uh, moving from Germany. So that's why I came back my senior year. Uh, Cause I probably would have stayed out there to complete high school, to be honest. Just, yeah. I mean, did you have to learn, did you have to learn the, the language I imagine to go out there or was there like a bilingual uh, school? No, um, no, actually, uh, surprisingly enough, if you're overseas, there are DOD schools. They uh, 
you know, the teachers are essentially contractors that work for the DOD. And uh, that's how all the military brats get educated. They go to the DOD school. If their parents are, you know, uh, if they want to explore different options, they can always go and sign up for a local school if they want to just put their kids' education in jeopardy for a little bit mm-hmm. until they learn the language. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, there's different ways, different methods, uh, of course, but uh, I'm, uh, yeah, that, that makes sense that you were, if she's working for the DOD, you get to go to the schools uh, on, on base, I imagine? Yeah, I was uh, going to school on Ramstein Air Force Base for a while. It was a pretty large high school um, because it's a huge base, like oh, yeah, yeah. gigantic base. <laughs> I don't doubt Air Force uh, bases being gigantic, man. Uh, <laughs> at least compared to yeah. at least compared to maybe uh, the Marine Corps. <laughs> yeah, no, dude. Um, yeah, the Marine Corps and Navy bases are usually a little bit smaller, unless you're talking about San Diego or Norfolk. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a couple, but most of the time they're pretty small. But uh, okay, yeah. so so then your that was your high school year, uh, your junior year. Uh, yeah. So then your mom gets done with that. And you come back. What what was it like? I mean, were you were you happier over there? Was it what's the different What's the difference between going to like a regular general school and uh, a DOD, a military school? Let's say. Um, the DOD schools were interesting because you had a lot of people from like really different families. Because uh, that's the way the military is. Is like you got people from all walks of life. Uh, that was the first time I ever met a Mormon. So. Uh, yeah, I had oh, a crush on this girl. Turns oh, out she okay. was Mormon. <laughs> I was gonna say, how would you get involved with that? But there you go. <laughs> if you like, someone yeah, there. yep, yeah, no, it, it was. Uh, so that was interesting for sure. So that was like my first encounter. Um, obviously, I'm not Mormon, but um, that was my first encounter with just like, com- like starkly different like religious views. Mm-hmm. Uh, because growing up in Chicago, it's like, oh, your buddy's either Protestant, Catholic. And then later down the line, all of a sudden we had like growing up in school, we actually did have like a eh, fair uh, bit of like, I guess, Arabic people living with us when we didn't even know, like they they just like moved there. And then that's when you actually came like, oh, okay. So like, you know, you make friends with them and you're like, all right, tell me about Islam and all that stuff. Right. So, um, but see, going to school there was interesting because number one, uh, in Germany, you can drink beer and wine at the age of 16 and you can go out to the clubs uh so that was my first experience with alcohol was essentially on the train drinking with one of my buddies that i met and he was from ecuador and he was going to the dod school too um is that like how did that work out well uh, i drank half a bottle of vodka and that was the first time i actually experienced drunkenness (laughs) what what would you say Uh, it was like if you had to compare to anything else uh, compare, are you talking about like with school, uh, just like the difference? No, in anything, anything, any experience, whether that's a, another, I'm assuming, I'm going to guess that that's probably not the first time that you encountered alcohol after that, right? Like you didn't just stop after no, that. No, no, right? after, after yeah. that, I mean, I was like, oh, okay. Like I woke up the next day feeling fine. And I was like, like, oh, okay, cool. And then I discovered the, uh, the tastiness of German beer. It's way different than like the, the stuff that, we were drinking back in Oak, Oak Forest High School, you know. <laughs> uh, I heard a Four Locos was like what most people were drinking around the time uh, uh, oh, we were God. going through high school. Uh, yeah, no, this, yeah, like that's a headache and a half right there. Like, you want to wake up with a headache? Get yourself a Four Loco, you know. Yeah. <laughs> what would What were you drinking over there? What was the, What were the options? Um, so, so of course it was classified in German, but essentially you had uh, ales porters uh stouts but they were you know typically classified in uh hefeweizen which is kind of like your normal wheat beer something you would find between like four and six percent alcohol mm. level mm. um and then you had the dunkelweizen which literally means dark beer you know or like a like dark wheat right mm-hmm. um and that's like your stouts or porters and that's going to be kind of like your ipa type of type of drinking it's heavy it's like drinking a liquid pretzel essentially you know <laughs> yeah i mean uh, the even the original one the the one you just mentioned the the one with six percent i, I want to say that's what ipa start at yeah that's usually like where they cap out to um but sorry i keep on getting text messages but uh You're good. yeah but no needless to say um 
but that's when I, my love for beer kind of grew. I was like, okay, I don't really like hard liquor, but I like beer and there's plenty of it in Germany. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah. And it's cheap too, man. Like you could order a beer at a restaurant it'd be cheaper than ordering a glass of water. Cause in Europe, you got to actually pay for water at restaurants there. Mm, that makes uh, that makes more sense. But I mean, uh, it's part of the culture, too. So it's not like you're going to get away from it uh, once you're living over there. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, they have festivals, they got the beer garden going. So you just go, you grab a cheap beer, you're walking around, public drinking is not looked down upon. Public urination is also not looked down upon either. Seeing people wow. just take a, take a pee on the side of the building is like normal, right? Like just out in the streets after a night of, you know, partying it up with your friends. <laughs> so, right. So then how did that, uh, did that evolve into anything? Or was there like, uh, was there a period of time where you were drinking a lot or just that? No, no, not really. It was, uh, during that time I was, it was about once a week. My mom would give, would give me about 20 or 25 euros, which was maybe enough to get into the club and pay the entrance fee. Mm. Um, you know, occasionally we'd, we'd, before going to the club, we go to the hookah bar. Um, so that was my first time uh, encountering smoking, right? Like as far as, well, besides my parents smoking cigarettes, but like doing it myself, that was the first right. time I was like, oh. Um, yeah, somebody hook, line, and sinkered me. I was, they were like, oh, yeah, no, it's it's not like smoking. Like you, you won't uh, get addicted and if it gets filtered through the water or whatever. I'm like, oh, okay, sure. Turns out that's a, it's actually just as bad if not worse <laughs> really uh, there's not much i know about it um is it doesn't it have does it have nicotine in it or what what is it that's yeah, addictive it, it's no it's tobacco it's uh it's okay. hashish right like oh. it's tobacco and it's like soaked in molasses and then they use those hot coals to um to slow like slow burn the tobacco with the molasses and that's where you get the flavor and whatnot from and then right. the uh water does filter out like the harshness of like the burning right but yeah, but regardless, um, yeah, it was my first time encountering a lot of that stuff. So coming back to Oak Forest, it was interesting because now I could no longer just simply go out to the club and drink on the weekend with my friends. It's like we had to, you know, go through hoops and red tape and whatnot to get yourself a six pack or whatever. And then we yeah. go to somebody's like sh shady house, you know, hoping that we don't get the call, <laughs> the cops called on us. <laughs> and you're talking about once you've moved stateside again. Yeah, right? once yeah, exactly. Once once that happened senior year, that was interesting. Um, just that stark difference in culture and also too, like when we went out in Germany, like when I was there, we didn't necessarily drink to like get hammered. You know, it was just kinda like, Oh, we got a nice little buzz, let's get out there on the dance floor and you know, go piss off some Turkish dude because we're dancing with his girlfriend and he's just sitting there <laughs> against the yeah. wall, smoking a cigarette and just watching. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I mean, so, so just like typical, uh, you know, teenager, teenage behavior when you're outside, like talking to yeah. some girl, whatever, get some guy upset, but it wasn't like, uh, you know, cause out here, let's say for example, you, you were going to a party or something like there was fights all the time. Was, yeah, you'd hear, you'd hear, you'd hear like that. So that wasn't a thing that you were, uh, encountering out there. Uh, no, I mean, there was definitely fights. Uh, in, in Germany, it was an interesting dynamic because this was before the like European refugee crisis and everything that happened after like 2014, 2015. Um, but there was still like a lot of racial tensions, right? Like the, so you'd go out and it's like, you were clearly the Americans, right? You had your German friends, you know, and you would meet them there. But like you were, people knew you like, oh, the Americans are here and then the Germans, you know, just doing, doing their stuff. And then, uh, in the area that I lived in Germany, there was a lot of Turkish and a lot of Russians and pretty much the Germans, the Turkish and the Russians all hated each other. They'd all hang out, but they all hated each other. So it's like, mm. you never knew when, a, when a fight might break out on the dance floor. So that's why, you know, the clubs had those bouncers, it's like once that happened and beer glasses broken on the dance floor and whatnot, people were getting carried out. The Polizei yeah. were called, you, you know, putting people in the back of the squad car. <laughs> what was the uh, response, the police response like versus uh, America? Uh, the police out there do not care as much about police brutality. Like mm -hmm. I've seen people get hit in the face with a nightstick just, just from disrespecting the police officer out there. Like they're pretty, uh, at least at the time. Now the things could have changed a little bit because mm -hmm. I actually have gone back to Germany since then through the Navy, but oh. uh, I didn't really run into that 
as much as like when I was a kid. Um, but yeah, I mean, come on, you see the, you see those European riots, like those, those cops out there are just smacking away. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. I've seen it. Yeah. Um, I did want to ask you before we move on, uh, yeah. what, what was, what is your relationship like? What was your relationship like with your parents growing up versus how it is now? Um, I would say so with my mother, it was kind of absent, although I've still like always loved and admired my mother. So anytime she did come home on leave, which was like once every two years, um, you know, I, obviously I wanted to like spend as much time as possible with her, but, uh, that also led to like a lot of disappointment in that regard, uh, just with how things happened as a kid and all that stuff. And then, uh, but with my dad, um, it was interesting growing up, like, we started out like best friends, like, you know, I was his little buddy and whatnot. And then he got remarried and then that sep- that relationship kind of split up a little bit. And then when he became police officer and all that stuff, um, he was a lot more irritable than I remember him. Like the dude was just kind of like high anxiety, you know, super irritable. You know, you ask him a question like, Hey, can I go hang out with my friends? You'd like, you know, essentially just, swear at you and you know be like what you know like oh you want to hang out with your friends whatever nope you're babysitting your siblings i'm taking a nap <laughs> mm-hmm. you know short I'm fuse, like, oh. basically short fuse and i can't say the the marriage at the time was really helping that either at all uh he didn't really have much of a support system at home i would say it was kind of like oh he's just making the money and bringing it home but like, it was a pretty much a thankless job, both as like being a husband, father. And of course, uh, I think he probably got more satisfaction at work than he did like being home, to be honest, mm-hmm. <laughs> for a while. So did you, did you get to spend much time with your dad? Uh, later in high school, I did when he was going through the divorce and stuff like that. That's when I kind of saw my old, my, like my old dad come back, like how I remember him as a kid, like where he was actually like being silly and being goofy. And like, we go do stuff and have fun together. Like we just go out to eat it's father and son, um, stuff like that. But, um, but now we're super close. That's the thing is now we're super close. He calls me like every other day, you know, just to chit chat. A lot of times he likes to vent a little bit too, you know, like if things are going on and he's stressed out about something. Um, and same thing, like if I got an issue going on, then just, you know, at some point during the day, I'll probably call my dad and be like, yeah, you know, this, this BS is happening or whatever. And I'm, just, you know, ticked off. And so the relationship like has been somewhat repaired at least it sounds like. Uh, yeah, no, it's been completely repaired for the most part, I would say like, you know, um, but we talk a lot, like pretty much all the time. And then with my mom, we're also kind of like, it's weird because I kind of grew up with my parents because they had me young. So I kind of got to see them go through the trials and errors of life. And I was yeah. often there with them when things were happening. How many, <laughs> when, did uh, you have any, did you have any siblings or were you the only child? No, I had uh, I had six in total. Did you spend time with them at all? I did with my, on my dad's side, because I was living with my dad. Uh, most of my childhood so you know I learned how to change diapers I learned how to give kids a bath making sure you warm up the bottle what to feed them what not to feed them taught my little sister how to walk essentially you know so it was um, wow so you were co-parent almost yeah I was was free babysitter that's what it was yeah yeah Yeah, that's the official job title yeah I mean it it does it does show I'll say that is um, you know people who it's funny, like a lot of people who go into the military um, were forced to grow up young. That doesn't mean that they're the oldest, but that means that they've probably gone through a lot that has forced them to go through a rough time. And sometimes like you kind of need direction because you've been uh, trying to figure things. You've been, uh, I guess you could say a, a chicken with its head cut off for a while. You just need that direction of like, OK, what next? Um, so I'm I'm not surprised given all of what you're uh, what you're saying that you've gone through that. That, yeah, I mean, of course, of course, you had to grow up that's with that situation. So, with your mom, you said that um, is is the relationship with that any better, or um, has that been? Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's fine. I mean, like we we went through our uh, our repentance period, I guess you could say, mm-hmm. when I was living in Germany, right? Like I brought up things like, hey, you know, like life hasn't been so, you know, it hasn't been sunshine and rainbows since you left dad and I, you know. Um, stuff like that so we went through kind of like a repentance 
uh, period and forgiveness period and like talk things out and have long discussions usually late at night. Um, yeah. And since then, there were, you know, I, like I know what to expect out of my parents, right? Like a huge reason why I went to the military was, well, you know, first off, I didn't really care about school that much. Mm -hmm. uh, I think after like I was getting straight A's and like scoring in a 90th percentile for like standardized tests until about sixth grade when I was just like tired of homework, like had, had enough. I was like, I want to be outside. I sit in school for eight hours a day, be with a bunch of people that I don't necessarily like, get told what to do. I'm like, when I'm home, I want to be home and do what I want. Mm. It's like working overtime at home, you know, right. <laughs> bringing homework home. Right. What do you think, uh, was, was a lesson that you learned that you got out of that experience growing up with your parents? Do you think there was one? Have you ever thought about that? Oh, there was many lessons learned, I would say. Um, I would say a huge lesson was uh, never get too comfortable. Always make yourself flexible and adaptive to the situation because things happen, man. Random things happen that just can turn your life upside down one way or another. You know, even in, in adulthood right now, it's like I've had good things that just happen in life. And then I've had some bad things that happen too, um, that have happened. Uh, so I would say just kind of like, don't take life too seriously. You got to find the humor in it. It's like, Oh, I know the world's burning around you, but you, you know, you got to laugh at the, the way that one guy's screaming, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, I, I think it is a fair point that at, at some point, uh, I, I think that there's, when you know you can't control something, you could either choose to uh, look at the negatives or think about what, what the next move is going to be to get you out of that situation, right? Because like you could also end up in a, uh, uh, where a lot of people end up is, is like this circle where, uh, you know, it's a negative thought process of, well, then I'm never going to be able to get out of this now and I'm never going to be able to figure it out. And then you get stu stuck in that loop. So it's helpful, I think, to at least look at what you, what the next move could be. Um, but it's also, it's good that you're also able to acknowledge that like, Hey, we need to address with whether your mom or your dad, this problem that we had, or this thing that, uh, stuck with me that I don't think we resolved. Uh, I think a healthy balance of those things is good, which is from what I hear is, is pretty much what you've done. If, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I've, I mean, I feel like I've done, so I feel like I have a really good relationship with pretty much all my family. Um, and yeah. And, I continue those relationships to this day. I probably spend too much time on the phone because of it. <laughs> like, like calling, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, people calling me or I'll call people to like follow up with them and stuff like that. And, you know, a lot of times you end up almost getting exhausted of talking to people because a lot of times they come to you because they, you know, they love and they trust you and stuff. So they'll come to you with their problems and ask you for your advice and ask you to analyze the situation and like at the same time calm their worries and their you know their their woes right yeah it's a it's a good and a bad um because it's uh obviously people trust you enough to tell you uh you know what's going on um and and i think like that's that, that's a that's a great thing <laughs> but also there's also you know you have to take care of yourself too right yeah that's that's what it is so sometimes it's like uh you know not going to pick up this call, but I'll give them a call tomorrow or something like, yeah, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So nothing wrong with that. Um, so then I, I am curious what, so then you get back, uh, you know, your for your senior year of high school, uh, what, what makes you make the decision, right? Cause I'm sure at this point you're already thinking about like, you know, senior year, you're always thinking about what's, what are we going to do next? Uh, everyone's already talking about like, Hey, I'm going to go to this college, go do this. You already decide that you, you, I'm assuming you already decide you don't want to go, uh, to college after this. And, and you know, you're, you're ready to pick or how did that happen? Um, I was kind of, uh, fit, trying to figure out the idea, um, junior year when I was living with my mom, because my mom mm -hmm. was kind of like, Hey, like, what do you want to do with your life? Like, you know, have you been putting any thought into it and all that stuff? And I'm like, well, I'm not quite sure. Like there's so many options. And uh, I'm like, I don't know if I want to necessarily go to school right off the bat because, uh, you know, by that time I was already aware, like, okay, you know, my parents aren't rich or anything like that. So I'm going to have to probably take out some loans. Luckily I did senior year. My mom offered me 
her GI Bill from the Air Force that she got, uh, but I actually turned it down because I was like, well, I don't want to squander it because I'm already not a great student right now. And I also don't know what I want to do. So I'm not going to just go lollygag for four years trying to figure it out when I, I need more experience, like more hands-on experience with something and see like, hey, if I'm actually interested in this, then um, then I can pursue it and find a goal within that realm, uh, mm-hmm. find a goal to shoot for. Because if I'm just going in there, you know, just with a, with you know, no heading at all. Right. Like, I don't know where I might end up. Right. right. <laughs> so <I'm> right. Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, I decided, um, or at least my dad, he came to me one day and was like, Hey, yeah, you know, they got a rescue swimmer program, blah, blah, blah. Cause I was thinking, Oh, maybe coast guard rescue swimming, but you gotta do two years in the fleet before you be a rescue swimmer in, in the coast guard. Whereas, mm-hmm. uh, doing it for the Navy, it's, uh, the air rescue program. So, and also it's a, like a Navy's special operations program. So I was like, Oh, okay. You know, cool guy job. Right. Being That's a, what I expected know. that you, uh, yeah. Special operations. That's exactly where I imagined you from <laughs> fifth grade. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, that's, that's what it was. Uh, obviously it wasn't all just special operations. Cause I mean, during the time that I think we both you and I were in, um, there wasn't a lot going on in the world. And yeah, we were peace you know, time. Yeah, it was definitely, there wasn't a lot going on. And as far as search and rescue goes, it, it's one of those things where it's always right place, right time, you know? And if you're not at the right place at the right time, you're not going to get the call. <laughs> so what was that like for you? Um, that was going to be my next question is, um, what was the process like to try out? Uh, what was, what was all that like? So obviously you need to go to recruiting office. Um, you know, they, they had it laid out for like the, you know, you could go to buds and be a seal or you go swick and, you know, be a cool guy on a boat, uh, EOD air rescue, um, and Navy diver too. That's another one that a lot of people sleep on, but, um, yeah. So I went in with the goal of air rescue. Right. And surprisingly at the time, it was actually hard to find information on that program because people weren't like putting out a lot of information on that program for whatever reason, like, and there was like so much to explain about it. Uh, and a lot of people, like even the recruiters didn't necessarily know. They're just like, Oh yeah, they're the dudes that fly in helicopters and moon us every once in a while, you know, when they take off. (laughs) (laughs) That's, that's interesting. I wasn't aware of that, but that makes sense. Fits the picture. Oh yeah, dude. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's a community of a bunch of silly dudes that like to work out and, um, yeah, it's expected you know, to do that type of stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's, that's what it was. So I was like, all right, cool, sweet. I'm already good, you know, a good swimmer. I think I'll be able to make through. And then, so you go to the recruiter and then you have to s- sign up for an SFT, which is, uh, uh it's like, what's well, a uh, special fitness test. I forget exactly what it stood for, but that's what it was. Um, and so it was fitness standards that you had to meet in order to obtain a contract on top of your ASVAB score. So um, during that process, see, I was able to get the contract the first, my first SFT. Mm-hmm. And then while you waited to boot camp, like go to boot camp, uh, I essentially waited for almost a year. So, uh, so about six months after graduation or so, that's when I went to boot camp is in December of 2014. Um, mm-hmm. but I got the contract first time around. Um, you know, if I didn't get the contract, I would have been an aviation electrician. Had I known that now, it's probably more money in that yeah. post, uh, post-military. <laughs> but like at the same uh, time, would you have been, would you have been satisfied with, with uh, not having gone, you know? No, no, dude. I, I'm like, for me, like my personality, right. Because one thing I liked about the, the whole allure of these, you know, the spec war spec ops community was, um, the autonomy that you get like there's you know people don't put as many rules on those communities as they do just like the regular like the regular navy you know the joe navy right yeah (laughs) um and so i worked closely with aviation electricians because i was flying in you know an age 60 and so i would actually work with these guys and i'm just like 
thank goodness I chose this job because I got to sleep for about 12 hours today and, uh, yeah. <laughs> always nice crew rest, <laughs> got the workout. I'm, I'm not working the 12 hours, you know, 12, 12 on 12 off. <laughs> it's common in, in, in a lot of military roles, uh, the 12 on 12, off, especially if you're like on a Mew or something like that, you know? So we were talking about the process of, uh, 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 of what it was like trying out. Now, what was it like versus what you thought it was going to be like? Was there an idea you had of what you thought it might, might be like versus what happened or was it pretty on point? Um, no, dude, it was actually, and I think this is the thing that a lot of people coming into that program in particular, they thought it was, they advertise it almost purely as search and rescue or like combat search and rescue. Um, when it's a lot more than just that, like on top of your, like your normal helicopter duties, like vert rep and all that stuff or like, uh, you know, pack packs, transfers and all that stuff. Uh, the Navy probably out of all the helicopter programs and armed forces has probably like the nerdiest helicopter, uh, <laughs> program going on. It's like, it's an H 60, but it's outfitted with pretty much all these gadgets and gizmos for, uh, like, you know, radar, a dipping sonar, uh, sonar buoys to track submarines, ESM equipment to, you know, get signal intelligence and all this stuff. And so I had to learn all of that, bro, like radar theory, how to, you know, how to utilize the sonar buoys and analyze sound in the water to track a submarine, how to, how to use a, a sonar and all that stuff on top of already having to go through rescue swimmer school which uh that's where you know most of the attrition happens like i started out with a class of 14 guys and we graduated only with six how um, long was the training uh was the uh tryout process it, so it was a t the entire pipeline was two years so after boot camp oh, wow. that's when your pipeline begins you go to pensacola for the air rush youth program uh, the Marines air crew program was also there too. Um, so we got to hang out with the Marines a little bit, <laughs> but sorry um, to hear that. Yeah, man, we, we always, if they were getting <laughs> punished, we were getting punished too. Like it sucked. bro. <laughs> Mass punishment, dude. Sorry. <laughs> it's like, Oh, one of you guys decided to get a DUI this weekend. <laughs> what else is new, bro? I'm sorry. <laughs> On behalf of the entire Marine Corps. Oh, you puked on the gate guard. Oh, great. All right. Now we're going to punish. Yeah, it was great. You never knew what you were waking up to, <laughs> you know, Monday morning. <laughs> oh, man. I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, that, that's yeah. So, then, so then you go through that. and Yeah, uh, so you go through that. Um, but yeah, you go through the air crew school and then you go through rescue swimmer school and then you went through a school where they kind of taught you like the basics about uh anti-submarine warfare, anti-surface warfare and stuff like that. You kind of learn the basics. You're still not really learning the job yet, but then you go, um, at least for me, I went to Sears school after that in San Diego. That's the so survival, that a, the survival course, right? Yeah. So I, that was, that was an interesting two weeks. It was like one week in the classroom, one week out in the field. And, uh, yeah, so that was super interesting. Um, but then after that, I went to sea school, which is like when you actually learn about the aircraft, how it works. You have to learn all the parts of the aircraft, how it works, explain how it works, memorize all the limitations, all your emergency procedures. Then you have to, mem you know, learn tactics and memorize tactics and all that stuff. And then, uh, oh, yeah, by the way, here, here's a gun. Like, you need to learn how to take this thing apart with your eyes closed and clean it and, like, what lubrication level it's supposed to be at. <laughs> mm -hmm. The real nitty gritty. Yeah. So, um, and then at, it, it was about pretty much two years on the dot. I graduated from my C school and got to my squadron, um, uh, shortly after that. Um, Jeez. yeah, it was, it was an interesting two years. It was, I would say probably some of the most fun I've had. It was probably the, the sharpest my skates were in the military, like, especially at C school, dude. And it's like, it's like, Oh, okay. All I have to do is just show up for muster. And I'm just going to go back to the beach, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for anybody listening that doesn't know what that means, skating is a term used across the military for uh, going somewhere and not doing your job, uh, finding ways to <laughs> to disappear and uh, not be noticed. So yeah, there's a there's there's some people that I knew that were experts at it, where like they just knew like how they could get away with it, like they just had to say one thing and be like, hey, I'm gonna be doing this thing, and then they vanish and like 
you don't think to ask where they're going to be for a while. And then when you do ask, they appear again at the right time. Where have you been? Oh, yeah, where I told you I was. And then it's like, <laughs> it's like yeah, I digress. <laughs> that was the tannest I ever was, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you got plenty of sun. I like it. Yeah, no, it was it was a good time. Um, you know, obviously the, the caveat is I had to be really good. Like if they were going to ask me, "Ooh, what's the what's the limitation for the bank angle of the H60 Romeo Seahawk?" and I'd be like, "Oh, it's this." And then they'd be like, "Oh, okay, he's been studying. Cool." <laughs> and then <laughs> so there's it, yeah. definitely it's definitely an art. Like don't fail any of your stuff. Make sure you're good at your job. You know, don't make enemies. Only make the right enemies, right? But uh, don't make enemies and you'll be all right. You know, you could get away with more stuff than a lot of people. Cause once you're on that radar and you're underneath that microscope, it's over. The alibis <laughs> are really important uh, for, for skater pros is like, if you, yeah, I was over here, uh, you know, with gunny, whatever, whatever. And then they'll call him like, Hey, was he over there? Yeah, he was over here. And, uh, and then that's your alibis. But yeah, there's some guys that got really good at that where it's like, they said they were where they said, but they knew how to how to go disappear in 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 spurts where like they missed the main stuff and then came back for when everything was set up and then like they just come back for a few minutes and do what they're supposed to do and then like leave again. <laughs> that's what those are the best well, ones. Yeah, yeah, no, that's definitely that's definitely true. And uh, you also needed to know you needed to read the room correctly. Like you needed to just be able to detect when they were looking essentially for people sandbagging essentially. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, so that was the key was uh, reading the room like, OK, how's chief acting today? You know, like, is he, is he in a good mood? You know, mm -hmm. does, he, does he look like he wants to just start tossing tables and keeping <laughs> us here until 1800 for no reason? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's plenty of there's plenty of days like that now. Yeah, I, dude. I, I am. I am curious what um, w once you got to your to the fleet or once you got to your unit, yeah. Uh, what was the squadron? What was the, uh, what was that environment like? Because everybody that I've talked to that has had, whether they were active duty, whether they were reserves had a different experience. Some had really great experiences with their units and some had, uh, with, if you went to my unit, you didn't have the greatest experience, uh, for most of your career. Oh, so, so, so what was your experience like with your unit? So I was living the easy life in my C school, right? All I had to do was study and you know, bare minimum stuff, no collateral duties, nothing. Right. Yeah. Um, but then I get to the fleet and I get to my squadron in Jacksonville. So I was stationed in Jacksonville, Florida for the rest of my career. And, um, uh, yeah, my squadron had just gotten back from deployment. It was a long, nasty deployment, uh, for them with the uh, Eisenhower strike group, which my squadron is actually back out there right now in the middle East. Oh, so, wow. um, yeah, yeah. So I know I trained some of the dudes that are actually out there right now, but uh, they just got back. Um, so a lot of, you know, the dudes were coming back salty and they're like, oh, sweet, we got a new guy. And then so, of course, I get piled on with all the all the shit work. Um, and I, like me, it was myself and somebody else I went through the pipeline with uh, that were like new guys. But I, I was the newest new guy and I was the newest new guy for a while until... <laughs> <laughs> so I was, Same. I was the dude, you know, I was always, yep. Yep. I was working, doing, running the flight schedule all the time on top of like, cause the studying didn't stop. Um, it didn't stop after C school. It, it was like, Oh, Hey, you, now you kind of know about the job and like, you kind of know what you're doing, but like, we like really need you to know, like in depth, everything, bro. You know? So it was like, you had uh, what was called level two and level three. And so after you graduated C school, you were level one. So essentially you were low man on the totem pole. Uh, you were still getting questioned all the time about like, Oh, you know, what's this, what's that, what's this, how does this work? Blah, blah, blah. This, you know, you have to do these grade cards to get qualified on top of like your, your yearly rescue swimmer stuff that you had to do like, okay, those procedures and stuff like that. And then you have to do like a test on top of like your normal fitness test during that process. It was another two years of training, essentially um, rough, roughly two years, sometimes sooner, sometimes later, but mine was, mine was like a little bit sooner than like the deadline. Um, it just really, it also comes down to availability for, you know, can, can you get in a simulator and then all this requires like a, an actual flight and all this stuff. 
Um, so that, that two years was probably, it was long and arduous. Um, and when I first got to my squadron, the first month we went underway again, cause they do that sustain X right after right. deployments, you go out for like another month. And that's when things were going on with Syria still like Trump just took over the presidency. And that's when you did like that missile strike. And so they're like, wild, oh, we might get sent. wild times, man, <laughs> dude, I was like, so they were just like, oh, Gallagher, I hope you packed heavy, man, because we might be going back out. It's going to suck. And I, like, dude, being on a carrier, it's it's like you're getting packed like sardines. The air air conditioning didn't work in the birthing. So it was, you know, at the time, luckily, it wasn't summer. And we were just hanging out in the Atlantic doing circles, you know, spending billions of dollars, you know, just to, just to flex. Right. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's nice until, uh, you know, you're actually going to do something, then, <laughs> then it's going to get real long, real boring, real quick. Oh yeah, dude. Oh yeah, dude. Like it was, it was rough, bro. And I'm like, I don't know if you've ever been on a ship while you were in the Marines. No, but, I haven't. No, but I I've mean, heard all about it. <laughs> Oh man, dude, like trying to sleep, like, dude, we were sleeping underneath the catapults when the jets would take off, bro. Like it was loud. Like you just get used to sleeping in loudness. (laughs) That's awful. (laughs) Oh, Oh, man. Oh yes. I mean, but at some point it becomes almost like the best sleep you've ever had. Um, but needless to say, so that time, that two years was kind of, it was rougher, um, because after sustain X, like the, everything slowed down at the squadron. So it took forever to like get my stuff done because they weren't doing as many flights and like, you know, people were getting prioritized over you, even if you were trying to get ahead and like trying to get qualified as quickly as possible. Um, so yeah, it was for a while, a little rough until I was like, Oh, Hey, now I'm starting like, now I actually know what I'm doing and stuff like that. And then they get confidence in you and like, the community itself, like being an air crew, especially like the, the helicopter side, um, the shops are really tight knit for the most part. Yep. Like it's a very tight knit shop. You know, you have you, the pilots and the maintenance, right? So it's like, okay, you can only get so friendly with the pilots and then like try to be nice to the maintenance, even though maintenance is always, you know, they're mad at you because reasons it's like, yep. because you're flying that day. So they're mad. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's always the blame game, you know, that, that was the case in, in radio too, for, for us. Yeah. Oh, Oh yeah. I've heard some radio stories from like air force guys and whatnot. Yeah. Fun. It's always, it's the blame game. Like, no, it's that <laughs> side. No, it's that side. We're up. They're not, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Yeah, dude, we that. had, we had all types of radio issues. Like of, of course too, I'm sure you, like, yeah, you know, we had all types of radio stuff and like, oh, freaking satcom's not working or, you know, whatever. <laughs> so well, there was there was a there was definitely a lot of like uh, blame shifting for sure. But for for the culture, what was the culture like uh, for you in that unit? Um, Given the fact that that job, particularly in the Navy, is like, you know, there are like the occasional unicorn women that actually make it through rescue swimmer school. Mm hmm. Um, but for the most part, it's mostly men, like all men, like you don't work, you don't really work with women very much or like, you don't have women in the shop unless you, uh, you know, unless one of your pilots, your female pilots walks in and is asking something from somebody. There was definitely a lot of testosterone in the shop for sure. A lot of testosterone, right? So like you'd walk into the shop and like somebody would just be on the ground with somebody else in a headlock and then some dude's just standing behind him shooting a Nerf gun at the back. Of their head. <laughs> so what was that like for when, uh, the few unicorn women that made it through, made it through? Um, well, the shop dynamic definitely changes, right? Uh, it depends on, it really depends on the female. Um, a lot like from stories I've heard, you know, I only got to briefly experience that towards the end of my career. Like after I got back from my 2020 deployment where, um, and we had a, a new check-in who was actually a female, but there was definitely like people didn't act the same if they were in the room, you know, like it wasn't, you weren't getting like their authentic personality. And then you also had like these weird, like competitions going on, like trying to gain approval from the, the one female that was in the shop. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the reason the reason why I ask that is is because um I, I'm curious 
as to, you know, how, how that changes the dynamic, you know, once you have, because in the Marine Corps, as you, as you already, I'm sure know, it's, it's a smaller number than let's say the other military uh, branches. So there's less integration or less uh, interaction with, uh, with female Marines. Let's say, for example, I believe the ratios, uh, there's one female Marine per 150 male Marines. Uh, and so, with that, so with that ratio, uh, you're going to have quite a, a disproportionate amount. And so then how does that change the dynamic? Let's say, for example, in, in a unit where you're going to be spending most of your time with that group of people. Uh, for, for me, I had, there was, I think one, one at a time, I believe like where when one female Marine would check out or one would transfer, like, yeah, one would come in. So we only ever had like one in the shop as well. And, uh, for the dynamic, I think what happened, I guess, like you said, it does depend on the person because, uh, the female Marine that we did have became like one of the guys at one point. And yeah. so, and that and was so, the ideal that you wanted. <laughs> right. And so, and we had two, right. So we had one where, uh, she was kind of like the guys, but like people also were trying to get her attention too. And so when it's that dynamic, I think that that's when it's, it gets really difficult to have like a, a, a good camaraderie because there's competition yeah. and it's like, if there's competition between the group of people who you're supposed to trust and like have a, a, a good line of communication with, uh, that, that can create a problem. So like, how do you get around that? It, and so that's why I'm, I'm curious to see how you guys handled that. Um, well, it, it was kind of a big deal actually, because when we got back from deployment, our, our senior chief in our shop kind of pretty much sat us down. And it's like, Hey guys, like we're getting a female and she's like checking in soon and all that stuff and, uh, whatnot. And like, you know, you guys need to not get too friendly. Don't say certain jokes, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, you kind of have to read the room cause we don't know what she's like, what offends her, all that stuff. And she has a lot more power than you do you know um so that was that was kind of like the talk and people were kind of like oh i hope she's cool like i hope you know she, like we can still just be idiots and whatnot right <laughs> and uh so at least with our female that checked in it was funny because i actually met her once before for uh an nha event like two years before that when she was like a brand new candidate just got out of boot camp and then I was doing a static presentation of the helicopter and stuff after doing a heavy night of partying and drinking the night before. So I was like hung over sitting there talking to me, like these bright eye and bushy tailed students. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so it was kind of funny. She's like, I remember you blah, 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 this, that, and the other, like, that's crazy. And I'm like, wow, that's weird. I'm like, yeah, I remember you too, because you were the one asking the most questions. And I was just trying to be done with the static presentation. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good way to remember someone <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was i was sitting there with sunglasses on and i was just like yeah sorry guys you know just got a headache <laughs> you know the, the I felt huge, yeah <laughs> yeah i was it was interesting but it was uh it wasn't too bad but we we definitely had a horrible deployment in 2020 like we got stuck out there for 206 days like straight at sea where um, oh you were at sea okay yeah we were we were in the persian gulf at the time. Um, but that's when the pandemic just happened. So all these countries are closing their borders and everything. And oh, yeah. so it was kind of like that, uh, that one show, the last ship or whatever, where like, there's that one lone destroyer, <laughs> you know, just in the middle of the, yeah, at, at in the middle of a, like a zombie outbreak or whatever. Um, but yeah, it, it was kind of like that. And so like, it was definitely weird, like, uh, how that all went down for sure. And like, just seeing, especially like I I'll always remember is flying off the coast of Dubai at night, just the amount of cargo ships that were parked outside of Dubai. Like it oh, made the city wow. look twice as big as it actually was <laughs> at I'm night with like bet. all the lights and everything. Yeah. I'm willing to bet that was, that was crazy. What would, how did you guys navigate that? Like how long were you at sea for? Oh, we were, we were at sea from January of 2020 until August of 2020. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, dude, we were we we were waiting for uh if you remember the Roosevelt strike group like that one captain that, you know, yes, some people Yes, I do remember. Dude, we were waiting for those guys, bro. They were our oh. relief. 
That is crazy. Oh, that sucks, dude. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, we were we were watching. We were glued to the uh, to I guess the phones, not TVs, but the we were glued to our phones, seeing what was going on because we thought that was crazy too. Like, like that that guy didn't deserve to get fired. But anyway, <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't. And my buddy was supposed to another guy that I knew from the from the pipeline and boot camp. He was a rescue swimmer too, and he was supposed to like come out, but he was just he sat in we, like for five weeks in Guam in a hotel, quarantining. <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah, so I was like, he would just send me pictures like via email, right, and uh, just like of him just laying in bed with like just a bunch of food and stuff like that, and I'm like, oh, you must must be lucky. I'm getting undercooked chicken and burnt rice again. <laughs> Did you? That was going to be my next question. Is uh, so you guys. Were you having short food sort shortages from how long you were out there? Uh, during the beginning, yes, because the Navy was still trying to figure out logistics because, um, you know, th- dealing with closed ports, closed borders, all that stuff, it was hard for the Navy to kind of like navigate around uh, a lot of that. But because uh, a lot of the times, like when the ship hits port, it also gets resupplied and uh, like you know, with whatever parts are broken and stuff like that, it gets resupplied with those parts. Like for example, our, our internet only worked half the time because mm-hmm. the, the antenna that the, uh, that was uh, being used for the internet, like one of, one of the parts of the antenna was out. So like, if you were traveling West, you had internet, but then when you circle back East, you had no internet because it was losing connection with the satellite. God. <laughs> Gotta love uh, military grade equipment, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mill spec, it's great. Spec. I love it. <laughs> Never trust that again. I know, dude. So it was, it was definitely rough mentally for sure. I would say that deployment, um, you know, because I also owned a house at the time too in Florida. So I was like having to make sure my house was taken care of. And like the guy that was cutting my lawn, it's like, Hey, you're going to still be cutting my lawn. And then like trying to figure out how to move money from, uh, cause you know, it's like Navy fed all of a sudden decided, Oh, we're going to do two-step verification and send the, the code to your cell phone. And you're like, God dang it. I don't have any signal. Right. <laughs> so you have to call. Yeah, it was, it was a lot, bro. Uh, but you know, uh, one thing that was nice was I was on a destroyer for most of my deployment. So I got off the carrier because uh, the carrier and the, like the small ships are definitely a, a large difference in lifestyle. And they typically have better food, like real eggs in the morning. Can you believe that? Real eggs. You mean, you mean not the, <laughs> not the ones that uh, come in bags that you have to put water in? Uh, yeah, no, dude. Uh, see, here's the thing. Here's the key. If anybody's watching, that's like going to join the Navy and whatnot. If you're on a destroyer, Yes, they have the bags of like the the gross egg slop for your omelet. <laughs> but now you tell the cook, hey, I want uh, two eggs over easy. And then with the ingredients of the omelet, because then, you know, the eggs are real. Wow. Tip <laughs> tip it right there. Yeah, uh, I know. Right. Before we do, uh, we're getting close on time. Before we wrap it up, I, I do want to uh, get get your take. Cause you did mention, um, you know, it was a little bit mentally rough for you that period of time. What, uh, what did you do to get through that mentally through that rough period? Well, I was lucky enough to bring my, my, my weights on deployment with me. Cause one thing about the small boats is that their gyms are not very good. There's only one gym. And surprisingly the boat that I was on actually had a good fitness culture. So it was always occupied by people. Um, so I brought my own weights and the reason why is like, I think going outside and just being out in the sun, even though it was 110 degrees with 99% humidity definitely helped. Um, you know, just getting that sunlight, getting the blood pumping helps you relax. Like afterwards, when you come down from the workout, helps you relax. That way you can get to sleep without like getting caught up in your head and worrying about things, whatever might be going on back home and stuff like that. And then also to making friends on the ship, right? Like I only was, I only had four of the guys that were also air crewmen with me. Um, so like, all right, you got those four dudes, but making friends on the ship definitely can help out. Like we weren't getting mail for a long time and during deployment, uh, but the ship was getting mail and that's because their mail was routed differently. So a lot of times, um, you know, asking for small favors, you know, like, Hey man, I ran out of coffee. Like, can I, 
steal some of your coffee or something like that. Or like, Oh, Hey, you know, like once you're friends with the guy, he might share some of the snacks he got from home in the mail with you. So, and then having that camaraderie, like I ended up, you know, hanging out with some of the, uh, uh, the ship's electricians and they had the best air conditioning on the boat. <laughs> and so, you know, I'd hang out with them and then they were playing like yo-yo cards and stuff like that. They had a bunch of video games going, like they do super smash tournaments and, um, play all sorts of stuff. So it was always fun kind of playing with them and hanging out with them pretty much how I got through it. Plus reading a lot of books or like audio books and stuff like that. Um, I have a bunch of PDF books still on my phone that, yeah. uh, I was reading at the time out there. Uh, the one book that I really liked was, uh, how to stop worrying and start uh, living. What, what, what does that entail? Uh, it, it was Andrew Carnegie's son that wrote it. So of course he didn't have to worry too much in life, but, <laughs> uh, pretty much a lot of advice and stories and a lot of anecdotal stuff, but like with some old scientific evidence too, when it comes to that, um, but with his take on those things, cause it was written in like, I think the 1930s or forties maybe, um, mm. But yeah, using some of the old scientific data, like, oh, if you're, you know, if you're stressed all the time or you're worrying all the time, you're raising your cortisol levels and you're going to give yourself a stomach ulcer. I I'm have like, heard yeah. that. I'm like, yeah, I probably, you know, and then there was techniques on like, you know, how to kind of get over those humps and how to get out of that loop of anxiety um, and stuff like that. So working out was one of them trying to get out, you know, get that anxious energy out. Um, or else. And, and know, what was the name of that book again for people who might be interested in that? How to Stop Worrying and Start Living, and then last name's Carnegie. I forget the first name, but uh, it was Andrew Carnegie's son. So the, okay. you know, the, the business tycoon of the time. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, before we do wrap this up, uh, I do have three questions that I ask every guest. Uh, uh, sure. What do you have going on right now? Right now, I'm currently uh, in school, you know, living in Utah, going to school, and uh, I'm married. And, um, uh, so, you know, going through the, the, the trials and tribulations of marriage, especially a new marriage, um, you know, and it's the first time I've been married too. So just kind of like working, working those, those situations out, you know, and getting through whatever issues you're going through as a couple, whether it be financial or, uh, what have you, especially since I'm going to school full time, it's like, you know, that type of, that type of dynamic at the moment you know, balling on a budget, but, uh, <laughs> um, we're figuring it out. Yeah. Just figuring it out. And I'm trying to figure out exactly like what field I want to go into. Like I actually want to end up going to law school, but we'll see. Um, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do for my bachelor's first before that, you know, I gotta, can't jump too far ahead. I gotta figure out what I want to do with the bachelor's first, but I'm only on my second semester. So I still have time to like take and choose. Awesome. Yeah. No, that's either, either way, whatever, whatever you choose. I mean, that law school is a pretty good, good career, no matter how you look at it. Um, so then I am curious, do you know what your purpose is? And if you don't, what do you think it might be? Um, my purpose, uh, I don't necessarily know what my purpose is, right. You know, if, uh, for anybody who's religious in the crowd, right. Like they always say, you know, God has a plan and all that stuff. Uh, and so sometimes your plans are not in line with those plans. And that's why I'm like, don't take life too seriously. Cause a lot of times, you know, you're not in full control of what's going on or what's going to happen to you. So I would say make peace with that. Fair enough. Uh, is, is there, if there was one thing you could say to your childhood self, what would you say and why? Tell your mom not to sell her Bitcoin that she bought in 2007 before the uh the 2020 spike you know <laughs> solid uh, <laughs> solid <yeah. laughs> uh i would tell myself you know uh my my childhood self you know in 2009 you need to start investing in property <laughs> um but now what I, what would i tell myself as far as just like general attitudes towards life is same thing that I've kind of come to realize is like, you know, uh, like my grandma always used to say, or still says, you know, you, you are in this world, but you're not of this world. You know what I mean? It's like, don't let the world, uh, have move you too much. Right. 
because then you're not in control of yourself. I like that. That's, uh, that's, I, I don't, I don't know if sweet is the right word, but that feels very, like, that feels like very sweet advice. It's you been know? helpful. How, how do you say that again? What was it? Yeah, you are in this world, but not of this world. I love that saying. I, I've never heard that one before, but um, yeah, thank thank you so much for sharing that and uh, your story. Uh, again, this is something that I, you know, I look forward to speaking further with you about um, going forward because, again, we, we, I do like to check in. This is a community, after all, so yeah, um, we'll have you on again and and catch up to see what you're doing. Um, was there anything anything else you'd like to leave behind for the audience? Uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, you know, I hope to be back on the show and we can talk a little bit more and delve deeper into whatever other topics maybe people are curious about. Um, you know, I definitely have the time to do so, especially once I'm done with finals. Uh, but it's definitely been a pleasure and I'm pretty happy that you guys are doing this. Like I never would have thought like, oh yeah, you know, Josh and Jake are going to be doing a podcast. <laughs> uh, yeah. You never know no. uh, unless you try, right? <laughs> no, it's, it's looking good, gentlemen, you know, keep pushing and uh, keep doing it. It's a, it's been a lot of fun and, you know, seeing, uh, seeing Danny on the podcast the other day, it was, that was also interesting too. Cause I was also curious, uh, like what was going on there. Cause I was friends with him back, back in the day, he was on my soccer team too. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. the hope, the yeah. hope is to get everybody, uh, the community that we grew up with first on the show and, and, and hopefully this inspires more people to get on here and, uh, and that we can all share through uh, our life experiences and, and hopefully it helps somebody. Right. Exactly. You know, it's people, it's always good to exchange knowledge and just like experience with people because uh, it all, it's always helpful, but it's been a Absolutely. pleasure, gentlemen. For all sure. right. Thank you so much, Casey. We'll have you on soon and uh, we'll talk to you later. Thank you. Sounds good.